Hello and welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Notion TV that looks at current events and re new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And on today's show, we're going to look at some quick headlines, uh, talk about something coming up, which we'll dive into a little bit in our next podcast episode. But before we do that, we'll also be looking at what we've been listening to this week and talking about some new scores that are out. So without further ado, uh, first headline. Uh, the AFM just sued 20th Century Fox and NBC Universal over music from The Simpsons that was used in a new theme park attraction. So, again, with all our headlines, you want to read more about it, check out the links at soundnotion.tv slash SAP, where you can click on and read everything else about it, including all the extra detail. Uh, speaking of, the next one, Hans Zimmer, uh, no stranger to our podcast, uh, wrote a new theme for the ABC World News Tonight. And you can click on the link and check out – Kevin, you said that's like underneath the dialogue you can hear. Is that right? Yeah, it, it's already in use as part of the broadcast. So if you hear kind of their introductory um, you know, headlines at the beginning of the show, you can already start to hear his new version of the, uh, the ABC uh, World News Tonight theme in there already. So Okay. Well, I tell you what, let's come back to the Hans Zimmer thing because I had a couple comments more I wanted to make. But, uh, okay. But let's – let me continue on. Uh, Randy Newman is nominated for Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's kind of cool. Randy Newman, of course, having scored uh, several of the Pixar films and all three of the Toy Story movies. So mm -hmm. congratulations, Randy. And uh, yeah, so those are my three. Kevin. That's right. Um, so just a couple of, of things, well, like Bill mentioned kind of in the news. Uh, composer Christopher Young, who um, – just recently, I guess, you know, has, has in the past couple of years started scoring more after, I don't want to say a hiatus, but maybe not being in the spotlight quite so much. I think he was teaching at uh, USC's film scoring department for a while and is now becoming kind of more active again. Um, really, I think beginning with Spider-Man 3, more or less. Um, he is, he's got a week-long residency at Butler University um, starting on, and that's right, go, go Bulldogs. Um, and that will, will culminate with a performance on October 28th of a suite of music that he put together from his film score for uh, Priest, which the movie wasn't hugely successful, but the score was, was very highly regarded. Um, so it's kind of cool to see that sort of show up in, in concert version. Um, in, in Hobbit news this week, it has been announced that New Zealand singer Neil Finn, who I am not familiar with at all, uh, we'll be singing the, the end credit song for the first Hobbit movie. Of course, that was the case with all the Lord of the Rings movies, that there was always um, some kind of special song to, to go through the end credits, and that seems to be the case here. I don't think there's a whole lot known about the song aside from uh, who will be singing it, but there you go. Uh, and also, speaking of, of you know people teaching in film, film music programs and things like that, uh, George S. Clinton, who is probably more, most famous for scoring uh, the Austin Powers movies, has been named as the department chair of film scoring at Berkeley College in Boston. Um, so kind of an interesting uh, appointment there as well. Cool. Yeah, and that Clinton is not related to the former president, nor did he have the parliament funk as his right. backup. Band. This, is, this is a different George Clinton. He has nothing <laughs> And all different Clinton. Um, what, real quick, if I could just take a step back, the the Hans Zimmer thing I actually did try to listen to, and so if you if you click on the link and you find this, uh, you said you said definitely you can tell it's there because when I saw it earlier, it was. Well, like I mean, some you can hear the music underneath the the kind of head, headline roll as the uh, the host is kind of reading stuff. Was know. it uh, was it Diane Sawyer? Would you? When you clicked on it, I see the 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 one clip that I watched. I don't think it was Diane Sawyer. It was like, oh, um, okay, who it was? Okay, because I was just gonna say I found uh, the one with Diane Sawyer, and in the background it just sounded like the ba 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 ba. You know the ba right. ba it's, ba it's ba, the ba, ba It's the same tune. I think it's just a, a different arrangement. Oh, oh. Zimmer's. Oh. He, okay. he hasn't gone and started from scratch with a completely new tune. Okay, well then I heard that because it just sounded yeah, like a, yeah. a, a rearrangement of it. Right. He oh. just had to be the one that did it. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Well. All right. So we've gotten to the bottom of it, listeners. Another mystery solved right here. Problem on solved. That's right. Streamers and punches. Yeah. 
So, so this week, uh, yesterday actually, was the release of the 30th anniversary uh, Blu-ray edition of E.T. Um, now, with the DVD version of of that movie, there, there, of and, course, were special features. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Be so. good. Um, on the DVD version, there were special features dealing with the score and, and some kind of archival film footage of John Williams and Steven Spielberg, you know, kind of both crowded around a piano going through some of the things with a, with a projector hanging out. With the, the, Blu-ray, the Blu-ray release this week, uh, it seems that I, I don't remember this particular footage being on the DVD, so I wonder if this is footage that they are just now releasing for the first time with this Blu-ray release. It's still Williams and um, Spielberg hanging out in Williams' studio, him sitting at the piano, and, and Spielberg kind of back and forth between the piano and the little film projector that's, that's there. Um, but they they get into more in depth conversation than we had seen in previous clips, and it's, it's very interesting. You can find the clip online now. Um, but they they get into some some rather musical discussions about well, the, the kind of juggling two themes back and forth, and where one should end and where the next should begin. Mm-hmm. But also Spielberg starts asking questions about uh, the, the 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 cadence of the melody. How should it end? Should the melody end by going up, or the, should the melody end by going down? And it's interesting because those are those are fairly musical conversations, and those are not the type of conversations that composers, at least in my experience, usually have with with directors. Directors are usually not music people, and so if you were to talk about a melody going up or a melody going down, or how the cadence would be different, most directors are going to have no idea what you're talking about. So I yeah. found it very interesting that that Williams and Spielberg were able to have that conversation and some of the ways that they approached how that works. It's really it's really fascinating. Yeah, I find it interesting because uh, it shows Spielberg being incredibly hands on with the music, and there's a part of me that's like, I bet, I bet in another twist where maybe the camera isn't on them, John Williams could be like, "That's nice, Stephen. Now go back outside and play with your cameras." <laughs> and let, let let the big boys write their music, but I'm not. I'm sure they didn't do that. But it does seem like Spielberg is kind of he's kind of jumping in there, and saying like, "Oh, could we do this or could we do this?" And there's a part of me that's like, "Wow, that's so cool to watch them work together." And then there's a part of me that's like, "I would really prefer making the choice myself. What note?" Well, and that's kind that of what phrase. happens in the video is when when Spielberg asks him yeah. if the melody should end by by going up or going down. Williams basically already has an answer. He says, you know, it, it, it hasn't gone up yet in the film. And he, goes, he even says, I'm going to save that for the last reel. So this yeah. this particular phrase will end by going down every single time, except the end of the movie where having it go up is is going to have some, some impact. So Williams is kind of there with an answer already. It's just, it's really fascinating to see that conversation. Yeah, yeah. So it's very cool. And Williams has like a little more hair and it's a little browner. Right. So, <laughs> right. <Yeah>. so <laughs> Dave wanted me to work back in my Elliot impression. So here's just shamelessly, I thought, oh, well, you know, Spielberg was pointing to one of the notes and he went, Elliot, Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyway, no, it was cool. And it's, it is interesting insight because it, you don't often see the conversation. And it's cool to hear Williams actually play basically a piano arrangement of what the whole orchestra is playing right at that moment. Yeah. And he just kind of rips it out. And it's like, there it is. And then I could just kind of do this. And then I could do this. And then Spielberg's like, hey, he's you're going to bring in this one theme, right? And he's like, yeah, here it is. And then he plays yeah. it. It's like, hey, leave me alone, Stephen, because I got you covered. <laughs> and <laughs> but, he's almost got... And it's it's not he's not just sitting there plunking out a tune. I mean, he's got no. the harmony and everything for no. all these different chunks yeah. of melody all set up ready to go. So yeah. if if he's going to go from A to B or from A to C, he's just sitting there and and, and does it. This it's not yeah. he doesn't have to cut and paste anything. He just knows how it'll go from one thing to another. So yeah. it's it's well now a real quick story. About that's how you guys work, right? You guys just rip it off on the piano like that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I let that. that we went that, to Juilliard. That, he did. MIDI piano. I let it just rip right off. I mean, I assume that's how that's how you guys work. That, that basically all the things we listen to are exactly the way you do them. <laughs> I mean, I basically compose them in real time. Absolutely. I mean, it's just yeah. I improvise yeah. it once and then it's done. You, you don't compose I just, like that. Dave? 
Dave, what I do is I just sing it, and then my crew of ghostwriters comes <laughs> up. You don't mess with perfection. You got it right the first time, goddammit. <laughs> I'm like Mozart, bitches. That's right. <laughs> we can cut out that bitches later. <laughs> I'll be the um, judge of that. A, there's a very there's a very interesting story about how it's a different example of Spielberg actually kind of being very similar, but in a case where we see John Williams, who clearly is used to working with Steven and he knows about his level of interest in the music and, and involvement in the story. Yeah. Well, with Back to the Future, Spielberg was producing it and Zemeckis was the director. And when they had Alan Silvestri, his experience up to that point was mostly like Chips, the the TV show about California Highway Patrol, you know? Oh, yeah. So, so it's like very... Um, you know, some trumpets and some strings and, and some small chamber uh, TV orchestra, stu- studio orchestra, but not not really big. And, and his Romancing the Stone was, um, you know, it, it was comedy. So a lot of rock band and keyboard stuff. So they get to Back to the Future and Spielberg is watching the cut of the, I think it's the chase around the mall, the, the Twin Valley, wait, Twin Pine, oh. Twin Pine Mall, right? Yeah. Twin Pine, not Twin right. Pine Valley. No, it's Twin Pine Mall. It's Hill Valley. Hill Valley. Okay, thank you. All right. Sorry, one film geek upstaged by another. We just, we just had to clarify the, the, the nerdiness hanging out here. That's all. Oh, it's just going to get better yeah. and better. The show goes on tonight. But, okay. um, yeah, so Spielberg is basically, like, crowding over Zemeckis listening to this edit. And he's like, oh, you've got to have, like, this has got to be way more, like, exciting. It's got to be, like, way more John Williamsy for the music. <laughs> he, he's, as a producer, he's making all these demands. On Zemeckis, his at Zemeckis's movie and Sylvester's music, and basically it was uh, it was something written by Sylvester, I think, from an earlier film, and it was tempted in, so it was a temporary placement of music while Sylvester was actually working on the score that would then go into that scene, and then he did he did bring it in, and it was one of those things where Spielberg was like, it's got to be like this or just won't work. And then they they were working on it anyway. They brought in the music and played it. And they Spielberg heard a later version, and they were kind of like, "Well, that's what we've got." And he plays it, and Spielberg's like, "Yeah, that's it. That's what you should have. That's yeah, that's much better." And it's like, <laughs> well, that's what they were writing for that scene anyway. So, right. so it's kind of like his involvement in music could easily veer into, "Dude, just get off my lawn." Just, yeah, it, it seems it seems like a really, really a double-edged sword. I mean, most of the time when we're working with directors and producers, we all have those moments where it's just like, oh, I, I wish you were a musician and we could actually talk about this as music instead of as yeah. this very abstract thing. And then the kind of what you get with Spielberg is he he can hang with the musical lingo. And then there are moments like like you're describing where you kind of wish that he didn't know that much about music and would just go away. On the flip side, it's like, you know, maybe it'd be better if you didn't know anything about music and just trust me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just produce it. I'll give, bring it all in Monday. Just let me try to write it and, and go through the ordeal myself, and then we can tweak it. But So, yeah, fun. So we, we've got a link to that clip up. We'll have it up on our website, um, soundnotion.tv slash SAP. You can check it out there. And I'm assuming there it will be on the the Blu-ray uh, that came out yesterday as well. Uh, another thing that has popped up online this week is a a six and a half or so minute preview of Thomas Newman's score to uh, Skyfall, the new James Bond movie, which we've talked about a little bit already, and and we'll be spending a good amount of time talking about on our next show. Um, it's it's three I, I believe it's three separate tracks. From the CD, just kind of jammed together in one YouTube video, basically. Um, so, so you can listen to those three tracks. I listened to it a couple times, Bill. I know you listened to a bit of it. What What are your first thoughts uh, about yeah. Thomas Newton's James Bond score? I just launched. I was like lame, but no, no. I actually, I really, really love Thomas Newman's music, and that goes all the way back to. You know his little his little Santa music for amazing stories back in the '80s, and then all his stuff where he got a lot of notice in the '90s. I, I love it. Yeah. I'm I'm totally on board with his aesthetic, even as as drone oriented and sound texture oriented as it tends to be. That's what I was very curious about. And there are a couple moments in this where I was like, "That's Thomas Newman for sure," slightly altering his uh, his sound for mm-hmm. James. Because arguably, if it's James Bond in action and British and 
full of intrigue. You'd have to kind of ramp up your style and your, your right. energy levels. There, there are certain expectations to the music that you have going in just because it's a James Bond movie. Right. Yeah, and I guess it's a similar feeling as when I found out Pixar had hired not Randy Newman, but Thomas Newman for Finding Nemo. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, Randy Newman writes all this rambunctious, active music, and that's a Pixar, that's the precedent for how a Pixar score is. And similarly then, I was a little concerned, like, what's Thomas Newman going to do? Well, he wrote Thomas Newman music for Finding Nemo, and it was beautifully appropriate, and it fit really well. Yeah. This one, I my first thought was, I hear a little bit of Thomas Newman, like I mentioned, and then, oh, wait, now it's just kind of like generic, like incidental background, you know, rhythms. And now it's just like all percussion, and it actually sounds like a slightly cleaner, less edgier version of Hans Zimmer. Yeah. It's yeah. like chugging away, uh, and it made me realize I don't think anybody can escape the the loop, uh, the the hell of Loop City. Like – you must write with loops or you will not work in this town right. again. You must have 87 layers of loop percussion for, for this action score. Otherwise, you're fired. <laughs> I, I, kind of, I kind of had a similar reaction to you, which is there, there are, you know, you listen to it and it sounds a little bit like Thomas Newman at moments, but most of it is kind of generic action, electronic loop kind of stuff that you could just as easily lift put it into any other action movie and, and it wouldn't be out of place. Um, my, my first reaction was, you know, like I said, you, you hear there, there are moments when it sounds like Thomas Newman and then there are moments when it sounds like generic action music, which is how it sounds most of the time there to me. Anyway, there are very, very few moments when it sounded like James Bond music. And, uh, uh, there, there are a couple of times when you have kind of this low growling, low trombone kind of stuff, which which is pretty characteristic from like the John Barry scores to the, the really early James Bond, the Sean Connery movies, which is great, but it's it's barely like a, a shade. I mean it's it's to say that it's it's certainly not a quotation or even stylistic thing. It's like it's barely a, a similarity. Is it a shade of gray? It, yeah, it's a shade of gray, yeah. One shade um, of <laughs> So I, I don't want to say that I'm worried about the score because I'm, but but what I heard I wasn't really crazy about because I thought it frankly sounded pretty generic. I'm I'm right now I, I'm under the assumption that all the big brassy James Bond kind of moments with the Monty Norman theme and all that kind of stuff, those just happened somewhere else in the score, and they decided to not use those tracks for this preview. And that's, that's what I'm hanging on to right now. Right, if right. We, we get to the film, and the film comes out, and it all sounds like this preview of just this generic electronic action kind of stuff, then I'm going to be really disappointed. But I'm, I'm holding out hope that there is that big band, brass, James Bond stuff that will eventually show up somewhere. Right. Now, uh, Thomas Newman does have a history of electronics, and once he got more well-known and started – having the kind of like Sam Mendes and, um, oh, uh, like Frank Darabont kind yeah. of film, those sort of dramas. Uh, I think he left it but kept his aesthetic but just produced it mostly with mostly with orchestra, maybe very tiny amount of electronics. But he does have – there's precedent for Thomas Newman doing that. What right. I would just say is that once it got generic, I thought, well, now it's not Thomas Newman because anybody in Hollywood who's, who's hungry – as a film composer, or well, I should say, who's starving, yeah. and, you know, could have could have come up with that. I mean, I didn't feel like yeah. there was anything specific. Um, after going to the Dark Knight Rises and noticing there is a lot of drums in this movie, and they're tense, and there's a sort of a, I guess, a little bit of a justification for it there. I just kind of thought it's just kind of like more of that. It's just a wash of. Yeah sameness uh, all over again and i'm sure somebody w will want to argue that because they were there at the recording session and they heard newman's music up close but just it, as a general kind of in a general haze of my first impression I, nothing really jumped out and they yeah. like you said there was no theme no motives but let me ask you this no, kevin there was there was there were, were that there was no moment that was like this this is a james bond thing and again, we're talking about six and a half minutes of music out of a two-hour movie. 
uh-huh. where they're so, trying to, you know, give a preview that hopefully right. is appealing. And right. this, it, this, the, it was like, here's, yeah. the high, here's the high energy that you'll hear maybe in the score. But, but Kevin, let me ask you this. Whenever you know, because you're you're a more of a James Bond fan. I, I like James Bond, and I'm you know I'm fine with the reboot. Right. I, I would. I'm probably a bigger James Bond fan than you are. You're probably right. That's fine. And would you say that when you know that a new movie's coming out, do you have expectations of the score? Well, okay. Well, let me just leave that as the question. You have expectations of the score, and then what are they? Oh yeah, it's. I mean. It, 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 there's there's always kind of an understanding that in any James Bond score, there's always going to be at least one moment where they've got that Monty Norman James Bond theme coming in on electric guitar. Every single score. Now, the, the one that kind of came farthest from that was Casino Royale, which was kind of the, you know, the James Bond begins. Mm-hmm. And so that whole film goes by without that music happening, except at the very end of the film when he is kind of transformed and has really become 007. Then they, for that last, last couple of minutes going into the end credits, then David Arnold lays on that, the, the James Bond music really, really thick. Um, but that's the only time it happens in that film. Other James Bond scores, whether it's David Arnold or John Barry or the, the few other composers who have been kind of, you know, mixed in there. Um, it's, it's there there whether it's it's you know a fusion of orchestra and electronic stuff like David Arnold or whether it's you know entirely orchestra like John Barry there is always that that big band brass quality to it um and it's it's there's always at least some of that and those classic James Bond themes always show up even if it's like i said with with Casino Royale even if it's just at the end those things are always in there and this preview, there was none of those things. So I hate to bust up you guys' film score geek party, but I have a, yeah. I have a question for you, list based on what you guys just said. Um, okay. If, if, if you're hearing this and you don't recognize my voice, I am headless producer Dave McDonald. That's right. Um, is, can you guys think of any franchises that are like the Bond franchise that are so they have such longevity but also have such specific tropes and in particular with regard to the score is there anything else that it really compares to bond yeah yeah I well mean, harry potter although harry potter is in a much smaller but, time but, span. Uh, yeah in terms of the time span i don't, I don't think star there's trek? anything in, well even star, star trek, trek yeah. different different movies and different series have have different oh. music well but um, there is a harmonic vocabulary in Star Trek that, that they talk about really well. That, that's, that's true. You could arguably say it, that, that that's part of a larger sci-fi space harmonic language. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I would argue that I would argue that, that Dave, that, that maybe Star Wars is, is an example because now you're talking about movies that are, you know, from the first to the last are what, 35 years apart, 37 years apart, something like that. Um, and that's obviously very similar music throughout, but then you're talking about a single composer. Um, but certainly not the, the 50 years and 23 movies that, that James Bond is looking at. No it, way. It, is, it is interesting because I'm trying to think of just what out there has existed as long as that has. Yeah. I can't and think even, of anything. And yeah, it, even, even if you think of, of characters that are kind of recurring, it, it seems like it always happens in, in chunks, like the, the new Jack Ryan movie they're coming out with. Yeah. There's yeah. always, it's kind of reinvented every few years, and there's, yeah. aside from maybe the name of the character, there's not much that's really left over. Or like With comic James book Bond, movies. Or comic, yeah, the comic book movies are a good example too. I mean, right. um, certainly no, there's no music or anything that carried over from the Tim Burton Batman movies into the um, Joel Schumacher into the Christopher Nolan Batman movies. But With James Bond, it's not only is it the music and some of the themes that carry over. It's 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 the tuxedo, it's the gun, it's the cars, it's the women. It's, there are a lot of things that the, the women, dark hair. What's that? The dark the, hair and yeah. the women. Well, well. <laughs> I was joking. That was a Daniel Craig joke. <laughs> yeah, I was say, Daniel Craig much not so much dark hair. Well, now Kevin, um, let, let me ask you a follow up question. Right? Did you are you 
pretty familiar with the Eric Serra score to Goldeneye? I, I am a, a little bit. It's certainly not one of my favorites. And that's the, the Timothy Dalton movies and then into Goldeneye. That's when the James Bond scores were kind of at their most cheesy 80s electronic kind of stuff. So okay. I'm not into those scores a, a, a whole lot. I remember they, all kind in of the stuff, production value was really low on the music, but. Well, I, I remember in the late 90s when I first started checking out the uh, the Film Score Monthly, you, you, you could just read each issue and you could kind of pick up like, okay, all, all you know, four or five of these guys in, in East Coast and then they, when they moved out to L.A., the, all four or five of these guys in L.A., they all kind of feel the same way about they like John Williams. They At the time, they didn't like James Horner. Um, yeah. But, I mean, I think since then we've all sort of wised up a little bit about that that, that those little differences. But – they did not. I, I remember this. They really, really did not like Eric Serra's score, and I think part of the reaction was the same thing. It's like, it's like they had kind of a list. Like James Bond needs to do this and this, and it's right. got to like love the orchestra. It can't just right. phone, phone it in with like uh, synths and and electronics. Right. And then one time I, I caught a little bit of Goldeneye right when Pierce Brosnan is in the tank. You yep. know, I, and I remember hearing the brass and the orchestra was like huge. And I was, yeah. you know, just that moment. And it's all themes. It's all James Bond theme at that point. And I remember thinking, what were they bitching about? Cause like, there's, that's the, like a really big representation. I think maybe uh, it was like the main titles or other parts of it. It's, are- it's, I really, you know, I really think it, it's the beginning of that movie. It's the beginning of the movie that is much less traditional James Bond sounding. And I think because that's the first thing that hear, you hear, it's kind of the first thing you remember. Yeah. Um, now, David Arnold, when he came around after Goldeneye, you know, he used a lot of electronic stuff, but the the orchestral brass James Bond stuff, he really kind of put on really thick on top of all the electronic stuff. I think he added to it. And that Which- kind of, yeah. He, he basically took or, or, or tried to take a lot of the J- John Barry James Bond stuff and sort of make it more contemporary by adding electronic things to it. But he certainly didn't substitute electronic things for that big orchestral writing, which kind of sounds like that's what the Skyfall preview, that's that's what, you know, if the whole score sounds like this, that's kind of what it sounds like. It's Well, it, it's it'll be interesting to see. A lot of electronic stuff, which is not traditional James Bond, if you will. Right. It'll be interesting to see if for this Skyfall movie, if they feel that the producers, the you know music people and the director, Sam yeah. Mendes, if they say, well, you know, it's 2012, so we need to catch up to everybody else. And so we need to just basically make James Bond sound like whatever other action movie has been making a lot of money, which would be in some ways like a big concession because it's like, yeah. hey, James Bond, you know, we we want to be, you know, we being other filmmakers – Right, we we want our movies to be cool, like your guy, because right. you you like Did, create cool. James Bond shouldn't so. have to stoop to the Jason Bourne level. Yeah, because it, it's not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we'll see. I guess. So of course, we ended up talking a lot about James Bond just now, but we're supposed to save we'll that. We'll talk about some more next month. We're, we're gonna we're gonna yeah. We'll, we'll save our our big uh, analysis of it next month when we can actually listen to the whole thing. Because again, we're ranting on six minutes of music right now, which is probably really unfair. Tune in. That's okay to hear a lot more about james bond next month <laughs> right this is the <laughs> internet it's not about fair and unfair yeah, yeah that's like right. curmudgeonly it's discussion fair. now just wait a month and it'll be even longer and thank you guys for indulging my silly noobish question no, 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 no. it's perfectly fine it's, it's... I mean, if we had to think about franchises it's like you know jurassic park is not enough i don't think it's it's three mm-hmm. right but... the, you know the only thing i can think of that's really long that has lasted longer than james bond is like dracula tarzan and and those you are know, just those are probably it. But those yeah. are things that are that are you know reinvented each time out. They're not a con, a consist you know a consistent narrative more or less from beginning to end. Not you know James Bond. You can argue whether it is or not nowadays. But well, I, I will say one thing though. Speaking of well known characters and musical expectations, uh, I just caught the trailer uh, this last week for the uh, the new Lone Ranger movie that's got uh, uh, Army Hammer. Yeah. 
Lone Ranger, and Johnny Depp, uh, of course, will play Tonto. And, you know, the trailer was like sort of paints this backdrop of like the Industrial Revolution and post-Civil War with the development of railroad tracks and trains. And you get the idea there's a lot of stunts in it. That's all fine and good. But um, then it kind of adds on top of that, oh, yeah, and then there's these two guys. And it's like, well, are they the main characters of the movie or not? (laughs) But musically, the Lone Ranger has always been portrayed by the William Tell Overture, which is classical music, you know, written by uh, Jacques. uh, It's not classical. It's it's like white, peppy classical, which is very different from what that trailer looks like. Well, I was trying to say uh, it's not Giacchino. It's uh, Giacomo Rossini, right? Sure. Okay. Is that you? Uh, is, that, is that John in Italian, basically? Me, uh, me, kind of. I, I think there are a couple of versions of John in Italian. Did not, you know, we should all probably look it up, but oh well. <laughs> but it's anyway, like we won't study this stuff. I mean, oh but, wait. I will say that it was very strangely used in the 1981 Lone Ranger remake, which had music by John Barry which was appropriate for the film because it was out west and it was very slow. And this movie looks like they're taking Fast and Furious and the, uh, like high-energy special effects. It's, yeah, it, it looks like a Pirates of the Caribbean movie because it's the same star, the same director, the same producer. Yeah, It's just on a train instead of a pirate ship. So I'm curious, like, are they going to take the Lone, the, the Lone Ranger theme, the William Tell Overture, and use it in the film? Or is it going to – I know we covered it earlier. Were they going to have yeah. a singer or songwriter – I would be I would be shocked if that music shows up in that movie. I really would. Well, that's interesting because they might use it'll be this. in the end credits for sure. Oh, I know what they'll probably well, Dave, our producer just said it'd be in the end credits. I bet what they could do is like if you've ever seen Speed Racer, they take the music from the old TV show and at the and the same with for the first Sam Raimi Spider Man at the very end of the end credits, they bring it in, but it sounds small, like it's coming yeah. out of the set, like it's yeah. got a feature on it. And they could totally bring in, like, you know, Hi Ho Silver and, you know, all that with the announcer. Right. As or, like a little- or Robert Downey Jr.'s cell phone ringing the Iron Man tune in the <laughs> yeah. first Iron Man movie. Right, right. Yeah. So, now was, was it Spider Man 2 or Spider Man 3 where someone's playing the Spider Man theme? Well, there's like a, like a, um, someone's just playing violin out on the street and they're playing the Spider Man cartoon theme on the violin. People are like throwing donations at him, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know there's a guy. There's a montage in the first movie that shows a violinist. Spider Pig tune. This the Spider Pig tune from the Simpsons movie. That's right, the, the same tune. Bill has no idea what the hell we're talking about. That's okay. Well, no, I know that you know Spider Man. Spider Man does whatever a spider can, right? Right. In one of the Spider Man movies, one of the Sam Raimi, Raimi Spider Man movies, someone is playing that tune on a violin, like standing out on the street corner or something. It, it might be. You're right. The, the William Tell Overture might show up somewhere in that kind of context. I don't think it'll have anything to do with the score whatsoever. Well, I would like to see a good score done for that film, but I'm not going to hold my breath because it's just got, you know, Bruckheimer's behind it. It'll just have, right. you know. So that what, means no woodwinds. Yeah, it won't, won't have woodwinds. It'll just be brass no and, brass and right. strings and uh, electronics and right. uh, whatever. Yeah, whatever Hans and his, his, little, his young cohorts throw at it. Right, right. So uh, I'm, you know, we're spending some time here talking about the the Skyfall score, and you can listen to this preview online. They've also released the full version of um, the the Skyfall theme song. It will be sung by Adele. Um, you can listen to that too. It's it's rather nice. The the theme song from the last movie, the Quantum of Solace, which was um, I think it was Jack White and Alicia Keys. I think it left left a lot to be desired. I think. This new theme song is is pretty solid, though, so you can check that out. All right, cool. Um, All right, so not really too much in the front of new CDs. I know that um, one one company, uh, Film Score Monthly, had a um, John Barry King Kong, which is from 1976, which is essentially a remake of the old King Kong, obviously, since that one's from the 30s. Uh, and it's like a two CD release. That's kind of a new thing. It's been selling pretty well. Uh, but then right after that, then uh, I think lo- the, one of the other companies, I want to say Intrada, then came out with, sorry, I don't have all the fine points on this, but my point is that there's not that much out there right now. It's because it's basically right. boiled down to two King Kong releases of, of what a weird coincidence that is. Um, 
but it's basically King Kong, two CD by John Barry, and then King Kong Lives, which is, to me, one of the hilarious things about Hollywood, is that let's do a remake to an old, old movie, a monster movie, and kind of also make it cheesy. And then about six years later, no, wait, make that 10. I think it was about 85 or 86 in the mid-80s. They're like, now that we made a remake, let's make a sequel to the remake. And anyway, so... <laughs> Yeah, enter at your own risk. But anyway, and that's by John Addison. Oh, you know what? I'm just gonna look it up. It's it should be John Scott or John Addison, but I can't. Uh, yeah, whatever. Okay, just I just I just do feel personally responsible for getting the information correct. Okay, John Scott. Okay, there it is. So those are out right now. But more importantly, I want to just talk with Kevin about what we've been listening to, other than six minutes of James Bond. Right. <laughs> Which, despite how much we talked about it, we have not been listening to just that. That may be the climax of the show, so everything from here on out will be the anti-climax. It's Whatever. all downhill from there, guys. Just tune it's out been now. Downhill since we started. I don't think it makes a big difference, folks. But an enjoyable downhill ride it will be. Right. Um, okay, so I'll just jump in. I did, in anticipation of The Master, which... I've been a bad film score person and have not had a chance to check it out yet. But in anticipation to it, I did pick up There Will Be Blood, which is also by Johnny Greenwood. And I was listening to it. Um, actually, Kevin, I didn't know if you had a chance to listen to much of it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I haven't seen the movie in a while. I do remember liking some of the movie, but not like not loving it as as an endearing film. But but yeah. like <laughs> as an as a form of appreciation, like. That that had some things about it that were really well done, and it was um, it. I don't know. It's just it reminds me of just film as art. You know, it's it has something for everybody, and it offends a lot of people and confuses a lot of people. And I'm thankful for those type of movies as well. They're very thought provoking. Provoking, and this one was. And the film score like went hand in hand with it, and um, really well put together. Uh, a lot of strings. Uh, mm-hmm. Some. Some of the cues featured like a chamber, either a string trio or a small, uh, just a uh, string quartet. Yeah. Uh, very, what, I, I don't know. For me, after listening to uh, all the film scores that, that I do, it, it just has such a wonderful sort of modern breath of fresh air to it, which yes. totally off most listeners most of the time. But right. it just, it about just give a shit. It's just, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, I love this that, one. That's- the one moment where there's this, like, I think it's an A in the middle, and and all the strings are either above or below the A, and they just glissando slowly inward until they just all convert, yeah. and then they it, land on the A. Yeah. It's some, something you hear, you know, you hear a lot of that type of thing in contemporary concert music. You hear it very, very rarely in contemporary film music. So it's kind of refreshing when you do. And and I've been listening to the score to to the master – and it's very similar. It's not. It, I don't think it has. It's not quite as as muscular as the, the "There Will Be Blood" score. There's. I think there's there's a certain violence to that music. Um, because that the main character is is a, a fairly scary guy, and the music kind of backs that up a little bit. The score to the master, uh, it it doesn't have that sort of violence to it, but it is just as experimental. It it kind of. A lot of the time, it starts sounding almost, almost like like maybe classical or romantic kind of in nature, and then it just does something really weird, and it, it kind of happens all the time. And it's really it's really refreshing. Um, the other score I've been listening to this week is is uh, Alexander Desplat's score to Argo, which is the new Ben Affleck movie. It's mostly set in Iran. And so it, it's basically what you would expect from a Hollywood movie set in Iran. It's got a little bit of orchestra. It's got a lot of the same action percussion stuff we've been talking about for the whole show. And then it's got some um, Middle Eastern, authentic Middle Eastern uh, Iranian instruments on top of it, which actually sound kind of fun. It, it, it sounds like it would be kind of fun to have hung out in the recording studio on that day because there are a lot of cues where it's just some people who, you know, specialize in those instruments just kind of sitting around jamming. And I think that would be cool. Um, but it's got just kind of typical Hollywood action stuff sort of underneath that. So by comparison, the score to the master is very, very much more interesting to listen to just by itself because it's much more experimental and adventurous and does some really wacky things 
Whereas the score to Argo is, it's nice, but it's, it, it is exactly what you would expect. And so by comparison, one, to me anyway, I think is much a much more refreshing thing to listen to than, than the other. Did you see Argo, the film? Not yet. Okay. It's supposed to be- I- that's another one that's on my my to see list. I, I've heard uh, I heard some really good things about it. Yeah, and so so good job for uh, for Ben Affleck. You know another another home run there. You know after the town. So right, yeah. yeah. Um, now I I did have a chance to check out. Ben Affleck doesn't suck. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Why? Well, you know I don't know if it would have been a good thing for him to do a Justice League movie as as was the internet rumor there for a couple right, weeks. Right. But I bet it would have been really serious. And moody, if he, if he <laughs> Batman would have been like even more pissed off, right? So. And the sky would have been cloudy and gray for every single shot. Um, so anyway, uh, I did see Looper. Uh, it's directed by Ryan Johnson, and then the score is created by his cousin Nathan Johnson. And uh, we did uh, give, give a little shout out a couple uh, shows back where I said there's this nice little feature. It's on YouTube. We've got the link for it. Um, we can we can put the link back on here because it's a, a five minute uh, sort of infomercial, I guess, about how uh, Nathan Johnson went around New Orleans where they were filming the f- movie and just had a little like mobile recorder with the little the little stereo pair of mics on the top, and he just mm-hmm. went around and recorded you know, everything that he could, kind of like he said, his heroes were like Ben Burt on the original Star Wars. And, but that's like mixing. This is kind of cool. It's, it's getting outside of music a little bit because you're mixing or you're, you're creating and collecting sounds from the real world, like, like industrial fans and the sounds of stuff scraping against the streets of New Orleans. And then mm-hmm. basically popped it all into the software and, and created sampled instruments based off of it. So he had sort of a whole arsenal of percussion and uh, that's cool. I mean, that's creative, and it shows that yeah. you know some thought, some consideration goes into it. I didn't notice any of that when I watched the movie. <laughs> <laughs> but so let's give that as the disclaimer that when I saw the movie, of course, Looper is not a normal movie released in September. It uh, it's really kind of like a thought provoking summer movie. But yeah. I'll t- you know I'll take it whenever they bring it out because it we, was we need it was- those kinds of movies. This- time of year so it's, it's a welcome addition yeah and it kind of owned uh most of the summer movies and kind of did what a lot of them do so uh and i at this point i mean just on a small on a small tangent i just think that uh that joseph gordon levitt can probably do about anything you know i'm because he's he does more or less a bruce willis impression but he's acting at the same time so yeah. there's a little joseph gordon levitt levitt but and if he's if he's acting and doing a Bruce Willis impression, well, because he's he, got to be failing at one of them, right? No, because the the scene shows uh, the 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 film makes the demand on him that he represent a younger Bruce Willis. So they use some makeup on him to make the eyebrows and the, the brow kind of look like uh, to have that visually in common with Bruce Willis. Because they said the rest of Joseph Gordon Levitt's face doesn't look anything like Bruce Willis, but he he responds to scenes uh, physically and and you know uh, emotionally like he does as an actor, but mm-hmm. also and this is what what he's really good at is there's scenes where they just ask him a question, and he kind of gives this little look a little from the side, and he'll either like take a cigarette out or he'll just have his head kind of cocked and the the way in which he answers the question very slowly <laughs> and with great deliberate style. Is like that's Bruce Willis, yeah. But but he's not not doing a surface like an impersonation like a comedian would do. It's not a he, character or anything like that. Bruce Willis, were young again. That's what he would sound like if he looked like Joseph Gordon Levitt with <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And it, but the nice thing was that I noticed it, but I I didn't feel that it distracted from the movie. So it was like the perfect way to execute that, and uh, and so I thought that was just that was just so fun. It was so cool. And there's a lot of great concepts in the movie. Well, but one, thing, but getting back to the music, um, I, I thought that most of it felt fairly. <clears throat> um, I thought it felt fairly uh, traditional, and I don't mean that in a condescending way. Like, like the love scene. Um, mm-hmm. uh, well, I don't. I'm not spoiling it, but all movies have love scenes. Uh, 
the love scene has like some very light touches with some light piano. And it's like, that's, you know, I was surprised that in a love scene, I was able to pay attention to the music because, you know, anyway, <laughs> we'll just stop that right there. Yeah. But, uh, well, but uh, stop. a lot of, you know, a lot of driving percussion, uh, you know, a lot of use of the strings. Um, and I did, again, I was so, obviously I was actually, I was a bad film music person because I was actually really entrenched in the film and only a couple moments did I grab onto the music because it was scored very well and it was really dramatic and intense when it needed to be and it pulled back and relaxed when it needed to be. So it was very well scored and then watching the special where Nathan Johnson describes it was very creatively approached as well. So um, uh, recommend it all the way. I highly recommend it. So. Well, there we go. So we've got you know three, three or four scores we've been kind of talking about this week that um, are all, all kind of thumbs up and worth worth checking out and as these movies come out at this kind of beginning of award season fodder releases i guess you could say yeah yeah all right well that will do it for this week um thanks again for listening uh you can listen to us on soundnotion.tv slash sap where you can subscribe to our show leave comments and find links to the music we spoke about you can also subscribe to the show through itunes my name is bill witham and I'm Kevin Wilt. And on our outro today, what we're going to focus on is a little bit of music from the master. This is Application 45, Version 1 by Johnny Greenwood. We'll see you next time. <laughs>